Hi, I'm Virginia McCarter Jacobs, President and CEO of VMJ Partners in Education. Thank you for joining us today for the Path Forward Summit webinar, where we're going to talk about mental health and its impact on students as well as learning recovery. It is my pleasure to introduce our guests. First, we have Mark Graves. Mark is the co-founder of Acceleration Academies and have been with the organization since its launch in 2014. As the Executive Vice President and Chief Engagement Officer, he leads all of Acceleration Academy's partnership development efforts and serves as the organization's senior liaison to all partner school districts. Thank you, Mark, for joining us. We also have Karen Howard and Karis Myrick. Karen Howard serves as a Director of Policy and Advocacy for Mental Health America and has 13 years experience in legislative and political affairs and advocacy. She advises and carries out the policy and advocacy strategy for a national consumer of advocacy organization whose mission is to put the voices of people with lived experience of mental health conditions at the helm of decision-making, both at the policy table and in healthcare. Karis joins Karen today Karis Myrick is a leading mental health advocate and executive known for her innovative and inclusive approach to mental health reform and the public disclosure of her personal story, which was featured in the New York Times series, Lives Restored. Ms. Myrick has over 15 years experience in mental health services, innovations, transformations, and peer workforce development. She is known for her collaborative style and innovative whole person approach to mental health. I want to thank all of our guests today for joining us and for our presenters. Hi, everyone. I'm Karen Howard with Mental Health America. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I'll be joined later on by Kara Smyrick of Inseparable. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit today on uh, the youth mental health challenges since COVID and school-based interventions that all states and local education agencies should be considering as they try to meet the needs of youth in mental health with mental health conditions and declining mental health, uh, including mental health education uh, services provided through professionals and supports such as accommodations like uh, peer support and um, excused absences for mental health sick days. There's also a whole lot of new federal funding um, and federal opportunities. So we'll talk a little bit about new legislation and uh, guidelines from the federal government that can aid local agencies. Um, and just to be clear, I wanted to note that mental health occurs on a spectrum and can be present along with mental health conditions or mental illnesses. However, it is not typically just an individual's issue. On top of individual and family factors, schools should be considering that there are social, environmental, and community factors that impact mental health of our young people today. This graphic was pulled from the U.S. Surgeon General's Advisory on the Youth Mental Health Crisis and Emergency. That declaration was made last December 2021. And he says that social and economic inequalities, racism, discrimination, migration, media and technology, pop culture, and government policies all impact our health and mental health. Um, and additionally, uh, neighborhood safety, access to green space, healthy food, housing, healthcare, pollution, natural disasters, and other environmental changes all contribute to mental health. Schools are now able to um, uh, get involved uh, and have additional uh, resources and community supports to do so. Um, we will go over those right after describing some data. So here in this first slide, you can see the CDC uh, released some data showing that in 2021, more than a third of students reported experiencing poor mental health during the COVID-19 pandemic, including 44 reporting persistent, sad, or hopeless feelings during the past year. A majority of students reported abuse or trauma at home with over 55% of students experiencing emotional abuse. More than a third of students felt they had been treated badly or unfairly at school in particular because of their race or ethnicity. 
Asian, Black, multiracial students reported highest levels of racism and were less likely to feel connected to people at schools. And while there was already a crisis in unmet youth mental health needs before COVID-19 and L with LGBTQ and female youth having disproportionately higher levels of poor mental health and suicidality, like self-harm or thoughts of self, uh, suicide, um, combining their stress with falling into the Asian, Black, or multiracial categories ensures that certain demographics are compounded having worse uh, mental health. And this is all CDC data. In the next slide, we can see from SAMHSA data that the National Survey for uh, Mental Health and Drug Use, um, multiracial screeners, the purple line here in 2020, indicated almost a, a vertical increase in reporting major depression. Uh, youth ages 12 to 17, um, before COVID uh, and, and during, of course, added fuel to the fire, um, just really had uh, increasingly uh, levels of depression um, that were unaddressed in, in many communities. And a third data set is Mental Health America screening uh, in 2019 and 2020. Uh, you can see orange reflects uh, 2019, gray reflects 2020, and turquoise reflects 2021. 45% of uh, 11 to 17 year olds in 2021 took uh, were the demographic of screeners, um, and that's a big jump from uh, you know 29% in uh, 2019. So more and more help seeking behavior from those ages 11 to 17 years old, and uh, we we hope to meet them online where they are looking for information and resources. In the next slide, we see suicidal ideation is highest in MHA data among youth. Uh, it typically goes down from teenage years. Um, we see, you know, 18 to 24 year olds having the next highest rate of suicidal ideation, but over 50% of young people who were screening ages 11 to 17 years old, um, you know, indicated thoughts of suicide or self-harm. This uh, next slide shows uh, concerns across race or ethnicity with Black screeners citing financial insecurity and racism, Native and Indigenous screeners reporting more past trauma, Asian and Pacific Islander screeners worried more about COVID-19, and Hispanic and Latinx screeners cite loneliness or isolation, while multiracial screeners cite grief or loss more often. And typically brain development we know ceases um, and is considered mature around age 25, uh, but roughly 50% um, of mental health conditions begin before age 14 and 75% of mental health conditions manifest by age 14. So there's an 11 year average delay between symptoms and connecting to care. Roughly half of white youth and one third of black and Latino youth with major depression received treatment in 2019. And as classrooms become increasingly difficult to manage, school personnel must be able to be, must be able to differentiate between behavior um, that should have a disciplinary response or behavior that should have a behavioral health response. Um, this is why we say policy waits for crisis or stage four. Um, it's not until you know after those 11 years and a person is really having a, a lot of trouble that we have systems in place to meet them, although crisis is, is too late. Ah, lots of marketing here. So in this next slide, uh, we'll spend a little bit of time here. I want to talk about how prevention and early intervention can be incorporated into multi-tiered systems of support. Um, with mental health education curriculum, 
being uh, kind of a broad uh, population level approach that can be available to everyone uh, to help school personnel and students understand mental health and mental illness, what contributes to both, to improve comfortability using terms to describe mental health and mental health conditions, including mood, anxiety, depression, psychosis, uh, mental health education also encourages help-seeking behavior and knowledge of where and how to in initiate care and support. And mental health education increases the understanding of treatment and support options. Education helps with overcoming myths that mental health conditions are individual or moral failures, um, but are also, and, and teaches that they're also heavily influenced by communal environmental factors as the Surgeon General's graphic showed us earlier. A meta review of effective suicide prevention strategies concluded that educating high school students with the mental health curriculum was one of the few policies proven to reduce suicide attempts and suicidal ideation. Uh, we also have state mandated school-based mental health centers um, that end professional development in suicide prevention uh, that all associate with significantly lower adolescent and youth suicide and substance use rates. New York State was the first state to mandate mental health education in K through 12 schools as part of health education and appropriations language. Um, it allocated $1 million in the 2018 budget and $500,000 $500, annually since then for implementation and also a technical assistance center that schools could use. For universal screenings as part of the multi-tiered system of supports, um, these can help schools conduct overall needs assessments and design systems to meet local community needs. Just as students receive health screenings for vision, hearing, et cetera, mental health screenings should be con conducted. And the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force added anxiety, depression, and suicidality screenings to its list of what should be covered for youth as young as eight years old. Finally, we don't always talk about this, but access to services and supports for school personnel. Oftentimes the difference between two students with adverse circumstances when one flourishes and another flounders is a reliable caregiving adult figure in their life. Um, it's really important that insurance benefits and professional development funds for school personnel include mental health education, support and services. When we talk about early intervention, we talk more about getting into services. So there is new funding we'll talk about later with the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act federally that um, some states have already gotten a jump start on even before the bill was passed to implement um, uh, services in schools. The Kansas Mental Health Intervention Team is one such uh, jump started program. Local education authorities and community mental health centers entered into memorandums of agreement and the state agency created the payment mechanism and a database to track outcomes. From these mental health intervention teams, approximately 66% of children improved attendance, over 50% improved internalized behaviors, about 60% improved academic performance, and about 70% improved external behaviors. The legislature has since grown the investment because they've seen from the database uh, that the money is being put to good use and has outcomes. So for the 2021 to 2022 school year, that program was expanded to 56 school districts or 212 schools. Next, I'd like to discuss youth peer support. Uh, many young people report lacking the language to describe challenges as a barrier to reaching out for support and want to access tools to help them care for their own mental health. They may also be unsure how to respond when they notice a peer in distress or if a peer asks them for support. So going beyond just mental health education curriculum, young people should have access to training that empowers them to talk about mental health and support themselves and their peers. Leaders must prioritize training youth in general support skills and promoting peer-led education. An example of general support skills to provide emotional support is VAR, validate, appreciate, refer, which is a particular tool for everyday conversations that teaches young people how to show up for one another. Another part of early intervention is accommodations, including excused absences for mental health sick days. 
A group of teen mental health advocates was the driving force behind passage of House Bill 2191 in Oregon, a 2019 bill that expanded the school absence policies in the state to increase mental and behavioral health or to add mental and behavioral health as a valid reason for an excused absence. Groups of students, including Haley Hardcastle and Derek Evans, partnered with Providence Health and Services, a major health system in the state, and advocated for the Oregon legislature to pass the bill in response to youth, the youth mental health crisis in, in the state. Uh, Maryland has uh, passed or enacted mental health sick days as excused absences as well. However, there are times when students take a mental health sick day, but then not are not afforded the additional accommodations that should go with that, like a grace period for making up work. And, you know, we don't expect people with a physical ailment, like a sprained ankle, to get right back in the game and start playing on that sprained ankle. You need time to rehabilitate and get back to, you know, full speed. And so we, we need to ensure that educators and school leaders are not only allowing for accommodations like mental health sick days, but also the support system around it that should be in place. And then finally, just to talk a bit about crisis, there's the July launch of 988, which is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline and, and Mental Health uh, Hotline. And this three digit number 988 is now accessible to anyone in the country who, who texts or calls or goes to the website to seek help immediately from a crisis counselor. Um, this is one part of an overall crisis continuum of care that schools can, you know, tap into as a resource. If a student is in need right away and, and might need to text someone, schools can um, make the 988 number a, a known number for students so that they're not uh, caught without help at a time that they're in need. Schools uh, can also partner with mobile crisis teams. Um, mobile crisis teams are an alter alternative to law enforcement and are trained mental health professionals and allied health professionals like peer support specialists who uh, meet a person where they are in the community uh, instead of police and help them with the issues that they're having immediately and, and determine next steps, whether that's in a hospital or otherwise um, resolving the issue in the community. And uh, as we know, there are many issues that especially Black and Brown youth face in uh, receiving mental health services and barriers to care that come up in crisis, which make it more traumatic for police to respond. So um, as an example, I'd like to highlight Connecticut, which has established um, memorandums of agreement between school districts and mobile crisis teams. And so if a student has a mental health issue or is in crisis, they would be met with that mobile crisis team of mental health specialists versus calling 911 and getting a police response. And then uh, this final, this slide, I'd like to just discuss how important it is to center youth in designing policies and systems. In some states, they have, youth have been a part of policymaking and some uh, boards of educations have groups of students weigh in on every single policy. Um, however, some schools, you know, have silenced the voices of youth and do not incorporate youth into policymaking and, and practice implementation. However, uh, students really want the skills, knowledge, and ability to manage their own mental health in, uh, issues and to help peers who are struggling. So we should value their voices by creating spaces for groups of students to discuss issues, to come up with solutions, and to be a part of implementing those uh, policies and, and solutions. By giving students a stake in the game, they will be more inclined to ensure the system works for them and then provide feedback when a policy or practice is ineffective. Finally, MHA's Youth and Young Adult Peer Support Report found that before talking to an adult or connecting to professional services, students have a strong desire to problem solve on their own. We should be giving them the tools to do this. I'm gonna skip through a few slides here that we'll come back to a little bit later uh, when Karis joins us and go directly to the federal resources that are now available. Um, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act is 
a comprehensive bill um, that was put in place or enacted after uh, the tragic Uvalde shooting. It includes mental health provisions as well as gun violence provisions. But I want to note that the mental health community sent a message to Congress. We should not conflate mental health with uh, mental health conditions with violence. Um, and addressing all of the mental health needs of individuals will not eliminate violence in our communities. Uh, we, we must address violence uh, at its core. Uh, please note that uh, the, the new Bipartisan Safer Communities Act had $500 million to increase mental health providers in schools and an additional $500 million to diversify and train the pipeline. November 3rd was the end of the first uh, notice of funding opportunity and the Department of Education received grant applications from local education agencies for using this funding to work with schools, uh, so to work with um, mental health training uh, and edu graduate education level um, uh, schools to ensure that there's a professional and paraprofessional workforce available to meet the needs of youth in culturally and linguistically appropriate ways. There's also a billion dollars to develop healthy school climates. And this is where we can incorporate some of the youth empowerment, um, youth voice, youth peer support, and even having trained youth peer specialists. Uh, youth specialists are trained on how to lead group meetings with young people and are usually between the ages of 18 to 24. Uh, and, and they have a, a strong uh, value in creating safe space and can contribute to healthy school climates. There is also expected guidance from CMS that will come out uh, in Q1 of 2023, which will help with uh, schools that want to bill Medicaid for mental health services and supports, as well as any other health services. Uh, since the free care rule was lifted, a lot of schools have not actually begin, began billing Medicaid or they feel like it's just overall too onerous a process. They don't have the expertise to weed through the bureaucracy. Well, uh, there's going to be new guidance and technical assistance in the new year for states and, and local school districts to, um, to be billing Medicaid. And there's also a million dollars in grants to support school-based services under Medicaid and CHIP. Finally, the bill had 300 million for safety measures in schools. And I wanna just talk a little bit about how safety measures in schools like school hardening can be harmful. Um, the, the bill included the safety measures through the Department of Justice and research on policy pres on police presence in schools shows negative consequences for the civil rights of black and brown students or students of color with behavioral health conditions. Uh, according to the ACLU's report on counselors and no cops. Also the Center for Law and Social Policy and the Department of Education um, partnered on a report that showed increased police presence in schools and other hardening measures harm Black, Brown, poor, queer, trans, and youth with disabilities at higher levels. And these Black students are two and a half times more likely to receive a referral to law enforcement or be subject to school arrest versus their white peers. When applying a gendered lens, other scholars have found that Black girls are six times more likely to receive an out-of-school suspension compared to white girls of the same age. And for undocumented immigrant youth, the presence of school resource officers increases the likelihood of youth being arrested for behavior that could have been addressed by school staff. A lot of this is available on the Center for Law and Social Policies website. So I want to note that as local education agencies and school boards are making decisions about school resource officers and where to put some of this new funding, millions of dollars in funding, they should think about how to avoid law enforcement, avoid disciplinary procedures, and, in, and support wraparound services and uh, youth peer support. 
I know this is a lot of information. <laughs> the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act also included $150 million for the Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which we discussed earlier, 988. And that will be implemented across the country. Um, schools should tap into that. Um, it also expands Medicaid demonstrations nationally for certified community behavioral health centers. And I mentioned that today because some of the memorandums of agreement that local education agencies can set up with community clinics can be the CCBHCs. Finally, there's additional funding for the block grant and primary care programs to help with ensuring that in the healthcare system, students are, are met with need, um, students are met with support and not just pushed into an adult healthcare system that doesn't work for them, you know, 11 years after they've started to have issues. Um, I'd like to, you know, uh, I have a couple more minutes here and just want to note um, that there's a huge increase in digital and online platforms and that you know um a lot of sig spending significant a time si spending significant time on these are youth um and certain amounts of time on online impedes sleep contributes to anxiousness and has other biophysical and physiological impacts a report in June showed that just one week offline significantly reduced depressive symptoms. And the problem is really worse for children than adults because adults have resiliency and critical thinking skills that you know, give them the ability to decline certain offers and attempts at marketing that children and young people just do not necessarily have yet. The marketing industry uh, you know, has, um, really uh, benefited from keeping children online for longer hours. Uh, targeted time online leads to advertising that promotes addictive behaviors, disordered eating. Uh, by 13 years old, years old uh, advertisers hold 72 million data points on the average child, allowing vulnerabilities to be exploited with extreme precision. And we also have uh, teenagers that have discussed wanting more help from parents and adults to navigate social media and the internet. According to one survey, youth expect to spend five to seven hours a day in the metaverse. And while cyberbullying is common with almost 60% of teens experiencing it and, and new uh, uh, features to help with parental controls, kids really say that, that adults are failing them and they need more direction online. So the Kids Online Safety Act is a new petition. That petition is to the Federal Trade Commission on the targeting of children online and creating kind of punitive damages or punitive uh, policies for uh, companies that are keeping children online to market to them intentionally. Um, and then the second way to, you know, become involved in advocacy, if you're interested, is through the Kids Online Safety Act, which puts penalties in place for tech companies that allow manipulation by advertisers. Fair Play and Center for Digital Democracy have led the charge uh, on the petition to the FTC. And there's also uh, a California bill that was recently enacted in August, signed into law by Governor Newsom, that is the first real comprehensive response to tech companies and online advertisers benefiting and profiting off of children. Uh, so these are a lot of the federal resources and federal actions. Uh, I wanna make sure that we have time for questions and for our next presenter, Karis Myrick from Inseparable, who's also a wealth of knowledge. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Karis will now share how resources federally can be leveraged at the state and local levels within the framework of the Hopeful Futures campaign school report cards. Hi, and thank you for having me um, here to speak with you today about something that's so important 
impact uh, to all of us, which is, of course, our uh, youth mental health. And so I want to talk a little bit about some work that Inseparable has been doing around America's school mental health report card. And this will help us think about policy areas in particular that support school mental health services. Now, I don't know about you, but, you know, I hear report card and I don't know, maybe it's a past trauma response from my school days, but I get a little bit nervous and I think about, oh, am I going to get an A, B, C, D? Am I going to get an F? And I think states think about it this way as well. However, that's not the the, the reality of how we should be thinking about um, a report card per se. The idea of a report card is for states to be able to, and policymakers and legislators, to be able to see where they are relative to certain areas that advance school mental health services um, in schools. And um, so let's take a look at how we actually did that because we, we actually didn't use a rating scale of A, B, C or anything like that. So um, the first thing that we did is we wanted to look at um, key policy areas that would advance school mental health. Um, and those policy areas include, um, as you see here, school mental health professionals, school and family community partnerships, teacher and staff training, funding supports, especially those that are Medicaid focused, um, well-being checks, healthy school climate, which is about sort of bullying and um, you know things like that, uh, skills for life success and mental health education. So those are some of the key policy areas. And then the goal of the Hopeful Futures campaign is to have a, um, a coalition of national organizations that's committed to ensuring that every student has access to um, effective and supportive school mental health care, and that the school mental health report card highlights accomplishments and provides important action steps that address the children's mental health crisis in every state. So the first thing we start with is looking at the number. So we want to be able to um, make it very easy for states to have access to snapshot data and um, contextualize what's happening in their state. So for example, let's look across the top here in Alabama. Alabama is only chosen here because it's the first state and you open, you know, kind of to alphabetically um, in order, you go to Alabama. So we have, um, for example, the number of K through 12 students is 719,000. And of, of those 54,000 um, uh, children um, uh, are living with major depression, of those 54,000, only 34,000 of those children with major depression um, has um, sought any kind of treatment. We don't really have any data about the number of school psychologists um, per student, um, though the ratio is recommended to be one school psychologist for every 500 students. Um, we do have a ratio for social workers, which is um, one social worker per um, every 250 students, that's the recommended. In Alabama, they have one social worker per every 8,615 students. And then for school counselors, we have uh, a recommendation of one school counselor for every 250 students. And in Alabama, they have one school counselor for every 418 students. So now when you take that information, let's go down and look at those um, eight key policy areas. And at a glance, just looking at our pencils and our the pencils, the pencils actually represent kind of, well, where are you? Kind of what's your status? Not an A, B, C, D grade, but we are giving like three pencils. And if you're doing um, well, all three are colored in, if you're doing okay, two are colored in, if we don't have enough information or there's an area for improvement, none are colored in. So for example, under school mental health professionals, we see that we don't have data uh, for the number of school psychologists. We have the ratio of one to um, every 8,000 plus students for social workers and one for every 418 students for school counselors. Um, that means that there needs to be improvement in that area to get closer to what the recommended um, ratio is for school uh, mental health professionals. We also have school, family, um, and community partnerships there. Alabama gets two colored in pencils. 
teacher staff training, they get one colored in pencil, et cetera. So that's actually how the report card works to make it kind of easy to look at at a glance. But what if you want to get more information, like how could we be doing better? How do I understand where this came from? I kind of want to know. So let's look down. So again, you can link um, each of the data sources for every policy area. And then also what we do is we want to provide policy recommendations. So here I'm going to look down at my paper just because that's really small for me to read on the screen. Um, and you all can access the school uh, mental health report card online um, as well to look at this a little bit uh, more in depth. But let's look at the school psychologists, social workers, um, and counselors, those um, uh, mental health professionals. So if we want to achieve comprehensive mental health in schools, let's start with school mental health professionals. And we looked at the numbers earlier and we saw that for, for one area, the psychologists, there was no data. For social workers and counselors, uh, the ratios were incredibly high and not near what the recommended um, um, standard is. So that gives a policy opportunity. And you see here um, in the red or the purplish color that that's highlighted as a policy opportunity to invest significantly in improve, improving the ratio of social workers and counselors in K through 12, including through um, incentivizing people to go into those careers. That's going to be really important too, because we're going to need a, a, a workforce as well. So um, we can look um, also at uh, policies that support and enable community partnerships. And so here they give examples for Alabama of um, where and how there is involvement of at-risk for at-risk students with um, schools and communities and where there are mental health um, partnerships. So um, when we looked at that information, it was actually um, encouraged to have these partnerships rather than required. And so a policy opportunity might be to move forward with um, um, having stronger language around requiring these partnerships rather than encouraging these partnerships. So you see this goes across the different areas of um, uh, uh, the different criteria, school mental health professionals, uh, school family community partnerships, teacher and staff training, funding, well-being checks, healthy school environment, et cetera. Um, and we give, again, these policy opportunities, not just the information, but you can link back. See how you can link back to different pieces of legislation. So here under healthy school environment, um, there's current policy that's around anti-bullying. Um, there's also policy around suicide prevention. And then um, it gives also uh, in the red, the policy opportunity. And we do this for every single state. So we also include um, tables with state ratios of school mental health professionals. And then um, we also provide policy pay setters in every policy area. So if I think about what's happening in my state and I want to look for another state that's doing well, it may give me an example by looking at those policy pay setters of policy or legislation that I might want to um, advance in my particular state. So let's take a look here, uh, for example, the school mental health professional ratios. Um, we can look at um, psychologists, and there, again, was the recommended ratio of one psychologist for every 500 students, and the pay setters are right below with District of Columbia uh, of having one um, psychologist for every 410 students, and Idaho for one for every 479 students. And then right below, it rank orders uh, uh, states, again, that are close to that ratio to very far away from that ratio with like Connecticut, New York um, uh, being right below. I think that's Montana that's below New York. Um, so then we look at social workers and again, goes through the same um, process and the recommendation ratio, recommended ratio is one to every 250 students, but we don't have any states that are outperforming that current ratio Closest would be District of Columbia with one social worker for every 365 students, for example. So we go next to the ratio of school counselors and the number of counselors per student. Again, ratio recommended is one for every 250 students. And those states outperforming that ratio are Vermont 
with one for every 191 students and New Hampshire of one for every 219 students. Again, with New York following sort of close behind with one for every 289 students, Hawaii. Nope, I read that totally wrong. <laughs> so we've got, again, sort of kind of tiny to read, right? So we've got uh, New York with, uh, uh, oops, sorry, one for every, uh, Actually, I can't even read it on this paper. It's so small, but you get where I'm going with it. So you can actually read down, you know, uh, we've got Hawaii with one for 275, Miami, uh, I'm sorry, Maine for one for every 311, et cetera. So if you wanted to look up your state, you could easily just go down, look up your state and see what the ratio is compared to what the recommended ratio is. So well, now what do we do about it, right? So here's some, again, policy state. Uh, pay setters. So we want to look across the country. Um, and we know states are different. When I name some of those states, we have huge states like New York, smaller states like Vermont and Connecticut. Uh, how do you even understand like um, how to compare them when the states are so different? So we recognize that states are diverse, yet they are making significant strides in adopting uh, to uh, adopting policy for school mental health. So in each of the report card policy areas, we do highlight again, um, these pace setters and what the pace setters are for is to serve as inspiration, motivation, and examples about what another state could do in policy areas in their states. So um, we, are, we also are looking at sort of um, funded uh, areas that are at the federal level, like Project Aware and things like that, because this these also serve as excellent models that states can have access to through federal programming. So um, we looked at, for example, we said um, school mental health professionals um, in the District of Columbia, it was exceptional for an average of one school psychologist uh, you know, uh, per a small number of students, et cetera, that we talked about earlier. So we give again these examples of these pace setters in each of the areas from teacher and staff training, funding support, mental health education, skills uh, for life success, et cetera. So the other work that we do in the Hopeful Futures campaign um, um, as we're looking at these different states is our goal is not to in one year or two year, so, you know, pass legislation in every single state or for inseparable through the Hopeful Futures campaign work to work actually in every single state. We actually work in states where they could use a little bit more um, support, where they could use an organization like Inseparable that is both a C3 and C4 to be able to do some of the legislative uh, policy uh, level work um, uh, 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 through the partnerships that we have um, in the campaign and through local efforts and state efforts in each state. So in 2022, we actually worked in five states, and that's generally what we'll be doing uh, moving forward is uh, working uh, with five or six states. So for example, we worked in um, Alaska, Delaware, um, um, Illinois, Alabama, and New Jersey. And um, these are some of the areas in which we were able to support legislate, legislation being passed. So in Illinois, it was a well-being checks for grades 7 through 12. Alabama, mental health services coordinator in every school district with uh, the House Bill 123. In, Del in Delaware, we had two bills, which is um, increasing mental health professionals in middle school and then mental health education in K through 12. We do have some pending legislation in New Jersey, which is around Medicaid coverage of school mental health services for all Medicaid enrolled students. Um, we were working in Alaska on um, legislation and unfortunately that um, legislation um, actually did not um, uh, pass, uh, you know, didn't really go all the way through. And that was for mental health education in K through 12. So uh, this 2023, we'll be working with five other states, including New Jersey, to continue the work that we're doing in New Jersey. So how do you get involved? How do you know what's going on? How do you get access to this information? 
thought you'd never ask. So you can actually just go to the hopefulfutures.us uh, website. And um, there you can actually click on your state. You can see um, how your state is doing. You can actually click on other states. So if you see a pay setter and you want to click on that state and get more information, you can do that as well. Because we measured every state's progress and policies to support school mental health services for every child in every school. So you can click on your state, you can call and email your elected officials, you can sign our petition, and of course, you can get loud on social media. So that is uh, the information that I have about um, America's School Mental Health Report Card, how you can use that report card, share the information, as well as use our um, Action Center in order to continue to follow along with what's happening with um, each, of, each of these states related to school mental health. I want to give a shout out, of course, to our partners. Of course, Inseparable doesn't do this alone. This is a partnership um, where we're working um, with uh, organizations, national organizations across the United States. These are not all of the organizations. We've added a few more, I think. Yeah, we actually have. So, um, and we meet monthly to talk about um, state and federal movement um, around school mental health and around a mental health, um, children's mental health issues. So if you want more information, just know we're just getting started. You just saw what happened in, in five states. We have uh, five more states plus New Jersey to continue to work on. If you need more information, you know, please um, visit the website, hopefulfutures.us or feel free to contact me directly. My email is there. And thank you very much for having me. And I look forward to chatting with you more during our question and answer period. Hello, my name is Mark Graves, co-founder and chief engagement officer of Acceleration Academies. And I welcome you to my presentation entitled Recapturing Lost Learners, Improving Graduation Rates, and Cultivating Hope, Agency, and the Promise for a Brighter Future. As you may know, Acceleration Academies is a national leader in high school re-engagement and dropout prevention and partners with districts across the country to offer a more flexible, personalized path for students who require something that looks a little more non-traditional than what they may be accustomed to in their current home school district. I'd like to take a moment to recognize two of our graduates, Tatiana and Brianna from Clark County, Nevada. Um, unfortunately, they had a gap in their high school experience due to an illness that their mother um, had during their high school experience. She was diagnosed with terminal cancer and so Tatiana and Brianna withdrew from high school to take care of their mother. Um, unfortunately, their mother lost their battle with cancer, uh, but Tatiana and Brianna hadn't re-enrolled in Clark County School District. Fortunately, our partnership came to Clark County back in the late 2019, and we were able to re-recruit and re-engage Tatiana and Brianna, got them back on their path to a high school diploma, and we're proud to share not only did they graduate from our program, but they are now Millennium Scholars at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. So who are we, what is our mission, what is our vision? As I shared, Acceleration Academies is a national leader in re-engaging young adults who have not experienced success in the traditional high school setting. We help these students identify the barriers to reaching their goals and help them overcome obstacles and build confidence with proprietary tools that help them focus on their classwork as well as overcome some of those non-academic barriers that we uncover. Our success is rooted in the earning the trust of the school districts which, with which we partner, the community organizations that support our mission and the students and families we have the honor of serving through our year round program. We wanna help school districts across the country reimagine and uh, transform the way that education is delivered by partnering with school districts to become their in-district flexible education partner, to graduate more at-risk or unenrolled high school students than any other program in the country, giving them a second chance at a life that will make them and their families proud. As you see here, this is a picture of another young man in our Bethel program in suburban Seattle, Washington, who overcame his challenges in high school to earn his high school diploma through Acceleration Academies, and he's pictured there with his daughter. So our program was uh, originally founded in 2013 by former school superintendent, Dr. Joseph Wise. He actually had a re-engagement model similar to the blended learning program that we offer when he was a superintendent in Duval County, Florida. He was always on that program about the lack of academic rigor and academic outcomes for students. 
and wanted to reimagine what alternative education could look like. So in 2013, he and some other colleagues set about learning as much as they could um, about this opportunity youth population of students. And so they had a chance to conduct surveys and focus groups of over 2,100 former high school dropouts who had re-engaged in drop back in academies to learn the triggers to dropping out and the critical supports identified by these students um, as necessary for them to finally overcome those challenges and become a high school graduate. So our program is rooted in the research and the learnings that we discovered um, back in the 2013-2014 uh, research study. Our program is a blended learning model. We operate out of a storefront academy and partner with Edmentum to provide 24 seven online curriculum that aligns to your state standards and district standards for achieving a high school diploma. And as you can imagine, our very at risk and vulnerable population of students require intensive wraparound supports. And therefore we institute a career coach and a life coach, which are guidance counselors and social workers or mental health counselors to be inside these academies to support our students on some of those non-academic barriers, as well as promoting post-secondary opportunities once they graduate. We also believe this program should not cost a school district anything. Our thesis is that a school district should do everything they can to prevent a student from dropping out and partner with a pr program like ours that's core competency and focus is high school re-engagement. This should be done at no cost to the district. We do this by sharing the per-pupil funding that is generated by the students that we re-enroll into our partner districts. Before I go on, I'd like to share that we are proud of our national accreditation. Uh, back in 2016, we worked with Advanced Ed to become nationally accredited. And in January, we had the opportunity to go through um, accreditation renewal with Cognia. Um, and I must share that those results were, were very positive. Um, the lead evaluator, Mr. Eric Carlton, said our program should be considered a global provider, and our um, index score was almost over 100 points higher than the national average for alternative programs um, in 2022. And this word cloud you see here on the right is actually a word cloud that was made out of the stakeholder notes that Mr. Carlton took during his vetting um, and exploration of our program. So getting back to the research that, that I mentioned a couple of slides ago, when we had the opportunity to study this problem, this epidemic, um, over 2,100 students responded to our surveys and focus groups and shared some significant themes across that research. By and large, students said that they didn't drop out, but instead they were pushed out. Uh, they required something that was a little more slower pace, something that was highly personalized and much more flexible for their um, considering the obligations that that they currently have in their home in their home and um, to employment. So our program is offered year round and is one course at a time. We embed non-academic supports to their personalized learning plan, which is basically an IEP for every one of our students. It is their roadmap to their high school diploma. And we're powered by proprietary tools that we've developed over the years to get even more effective at the work that we do. Students create their own weekly on-site schedule to attend one of our storefront academies in their partner district. Um, these academies are operating 10 to 12 hours per day. We're also getting really good since the COVID um, pandemic around remote support and the use of Zoom to connect with our GCs, our graduation candidates um, in the evenings and on the weekends. By and large, these students said they wanted, that, wanted something that looks and feels a lot different than what they're used to. So as you can see from this picture, um, of, our, of our Charleston, South Carolina Academy, we don't have classrooms or rows of desks. Um, our academies look much more mature, um, something between say a, a cross between a Starbucks and a community college student center. Student center. The wraparound supports that I mentioned early, earlier are also critical um, to our model and to the support of the students that we serve. So we have mental health counselors, social workers, guidance counselors to help with those non-academic barriers, to help with post-secondary opportunities. Um, and we also use restorative practices for, framework um, for any discipline and issues that we have in our academy. But by and large, because students want to be here, um, we don't have very many discipline issues to speak of. We're also really intentional about post-secondary opportunities. We have folks on the team at the national level and inside our academies that are helping identify post-secondary opportunities, whether it be enrollment at a technical college, um, the pursuit of a certificate or work credential, 
um, WIOA programs, workforce development programs. We want to help connect our students and make them competitive for the gaps in the local job markets. And so we, we have a very deep, um, deep bench of support for those, those efforts inside our academies. And again, we're talking about re-engaging students who have withdrawn from the school district, um, grades nine through 12, and also sit to serve as a program within the district's continuum of services for those students who come to the high school principal or guidance counselor and say simply, life circumstances have gotten in the way and I can no longer commit to the traditional bell schedule uh, of high school. And so we serve as a program, a referral source for those students um, and for those school uh, district leaders who want to offer something different so that those students aren't in fact dropping out. We are a national program. We currently serve students in seven states. We have a national enrollment approaching 4,000 students, and we're getting ready to celebrate our 2,000th graduate across the country. We don't class our students based on senior, junior, sophomore, and freshman. We think it's rather demoralizing to tell a 19-year-old with two credits that he or she is a freshman. And so instead, we tier our graduation candidates based upon the number of credits remaining to earn their high school diploma. Um, tier four means that a student has five or fewer credits remaining to earn their diploma. So as you can see here, we've got over 600 students who are right there at the cusp of becoming a high school graduate who we expect to see cross that finish line um, by next May. We measure weekly engagement by the percentage of GCs or graduation candidates who are submitting a graded assignment, um, considering that by and large, the students we serve have had extensive gaps in their educational programming. Uh, we're proud to share that over 80% of our students are in fact completing a graded assignment each week and submitting that for, for a grade. We're able to serve students who are on a traditional um, high school diploma track, about 12.5% of our students across the country have an IEP or a 504 plan. And we do provide ELL supports to tier, tier four and above uh, ELL students we have at least one member of the team who has a designation um, for ELL services. As you can see here, this is a list of our current partner districts. We partner with large urban districts and some of the more rural districts across the country. Um, we're currently serving, like I said, seven states, um, Washington, Nevada, Texas, Kansas, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. So how we partner for success. Because we become a program of the school district, we require school board approve, approval. We also have to identify um, how we're going to collaborate and work together with different departments within a school district. Even though we have our own HR system, we do our own hiring of the staff. They are our staff members. Um, we work with the district's HR team for badging and background checks with the um, information systems uh, team to identify eligible students and to report positive uh, attendance as well as academic outcomes special education services, food services, about 95% of our students um, are eligible for free and reduced lunch. So uh, where we can partner to provide meals for students, we do. Um, the district also will provide a, a list of eligible students. And those are the students that we will target when we launch our program. We have a national call center and we hire local canvassers called engagement coaches who go door to door and knock on the last known address of these students that we hope to re-engage to um, invite them to join the program. We also have what we call an implementation planning guide. And so after we have board approval, we visit the local um, school district and have these implementation planning meetings with um, key department leaders to identify again how those collaborations will work in support of the students. Our team will geomap the list of eligible students to determine the best site selection. Uh, we hire a team of about 12 to 15 local staff members to operate the academy. We identify and build out the storefront academy all at our own expense, and then we begin recruiting the list of eligible students. And as I said, um, through our work with ITS, we report data on a daily basis back to um, the partner district. For that, the district will generate those lists of eligible students on a monthly basis. They'll train our team members on um, submitting information through the uh, student information system, provide a district liaison that we could connect with on a daily basis if need be, and we revenue share, again, on these, on these students that we bring back into the district that we're serving. And before I move on, I'd like to highlight Luke here. He, is, um, he was the first graduate of our partnership with the Clark County School District in Las Vegas. And we have a tradition of sending students, um, typically once they graduate, to a board meeting to express their um, gratitude and appreciation for the superintendent and board 
uh, members bringing this program to the district so that they do have this last best chance of becoming a high school graduate. And this is Luke here um, back in 2019 expressing his um, appreciation for the opportunity. So like I said, we will go about hiring a local team of about 12 to 15 folks, all local to the area, including a district director, typically somebody who has a master's in education and leadership. This person serves as our principal. Um, we will hire five state licensed teachers in the four core areas in special education. We have a success coach, which is either a social worker or a mental health counselor, because again, oftentimes it's Maslow's before Bloom. Um, we're bulldozing non-academic barriers, whether that be um, teen pregnancy, drug involved, homelessness, food scarcity, anxiety issues, bullying. Um, we want to help support our students in those, in those areas as well. Um, not only academics, it's supporting the whole student. The career coach um, is a licensed high school guidance counselor position. They are targeted with ensuring that our students are meeting those graduation requirements and also putting them on a path to being competitive in the local job market. We do not want our students to earn their high school diploma and go right back to the streets or back to the couch. We want them excited, inspired, and prepared for what's next in their life, whether that be returning to the job force, the military, a local technical college, or a four-year university. The most important um, role in the organization, in my opinion, is the graduation candidate advocate. This is our paraprofessional role. This is our one-to-one -one mentor role for each of our students. Um, they are tar targeted or they are charged with learning why the traditional model didn't work for that student and helping to motivate and inspire them to want to earn this piece of paper that perhaps not many people in their home have um, achieved in the past. And so um, it's really important that we develop strong relationships with our students. This, this work is so relationship-based. Um, and so those GCAs are in place there to, again, um, help motivate and support um, our GCs along the way. And we also have a registrar um, for those key academic support pieces and graduation requirements. I talked a little bit in the beginning about the proprietary tools that we've developed over the years. <clears throat> and we've um, developed our own student information system that tracks not only um, on-site engagement, but online engagement, case management notes on our students, um, tracking academic progress. This system that we built allows our staff members in real time to track engagement, um, to build reports that help drive the day's work and how we need to go about pursuing the students who have perhaps not met their engagement requirement for the week. But it allows us in real time to track where our students are, and it really provides a nice holistic history of our experience in our time in supporting that student. It begins with the very first recruitment call and hopefully ends with um, the declaration that the student has become a high school graduate. We also developed a tool um, called the Graduation Persistence Index. When we got started back in 2014, we weren't really great at keeping our students engaged, and we knew that our program needed to look a little different than the traditional model um, and the traditional supports that a student was used to receiving. And so we knew that there were non-academic barriers that were preventing students from being successful. And so we set out to identify how we could um, measure those non-academic barriers. And so through a meta-analysis of non-academic barriers for students, we created this assessment that is um, given to each one of our GCs upon, um, during orientation that helps identify what those barriers are, whether they are a teen parent, um, whether test anxiety or social anxiety is an issue for that student. And then we build those um, tailored supports, embed them in the, the student's personalized learning plan right there alongside those academic supports that so that those issues are being addressed as well. And in, and in our hopes of creating an experience that is much different and much more supported, flexible and personalized than what the student um, experienced previously. We code our students red, yellow, and green are based on those um, issues and those um, barriers that are identified. And we're constantly checking in with um, our students to, to ensure that they are overcoming those barriers with the supports that we're providing. Again, as I mentioned previously, we're really um, taking a look at building a deep and robust um, CTE program and post-secondary program. Again, we want to prepare our students for uh, employment, for being competitive in the local job market, and we want them to have a post-secondary path that they're excited about and motivated by so that they'll complete their degree and, and want to move on to the next best thing in life. And so we've got 
folks at the network level and inside the academies helping to support um, those post-secondary opportunities for our students. So as we begin to have conversations with the prospective school district, we like to understand what the potential impact could be um, for our program in the district. And so we take a look at um, the previous four cohorts and identify how many students were not on time graduates so that we could estimate the number of students we might be able to um, pursue, support, and re-engage and re-enroll in the program. As you can see here, this is a, a model uh, district that we're using for this exercise here. Uh, their graduation um, rates were in the 70s, and it, based on this data, it looks like there are about 7,000 students who would be um, eligible for the program in, in this district. And so that might be a next step that we pursue if your district is interested in Acceleration Academies to determine the number of students who would be eligible. Some possible next steps. So we're really proud to share that all 15 of our partner districts are referenceable. Um, we would be happy to connect you to any number of the, student, uh, the superintendents or liaisons that we partner and work with every single day. Um, I'm also proud to share that the lead evaluator from Cognia, Mr. Eric Carlton, um, said he would be happy to provide um, a, a reference for the Acceleration Academy program as he's become quite well versed in the model, um, having led the uh, accreditation renewal in January. We also um, like to offer the opportunity for prospective district leaders to um, visit one of our academies. And uh, we typically send folks to the Low Country Acceleration Academy in Charleston, South Carolina. But again, we could host you and your team at any one of our academies across the country. If you're interested, we can share some of our um, documentation with you, whether it be a contract template or that implementation planning guide that I referenced earlier. And what I might ask is if you'd like to, to take a next step, perhaps take a look at the, the number of students who would be eligible for the program and help build the case that um, uh, partnering with Acceleration Academies could mean a new future, a brighter future for you know a few thousand students, for example. And so we'd love to take a look at that um, and see what the potential is. In closing, this is a video um, of a, uh, the, the work that we're doing in the Bethel um, Acceleration Academy. Um, this was a video that was actually produced by our partners in the school district. And um, I'll make this presentation available to anyone who would like to have a copy of it. And uh, we'll get that out to you um, in short order. So at this time, I think we'll open it up for questions. And I appreciate your time and interest in supporting this uh, group of students who uh, they've got the ability. Uh, they just may need a, a little more different path at, at earning that high school diploma, and we'd be happy to provide that path in your district. So thanks so much for your time, and I look forward to your questions.